and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast. This is David Bonson. I am the Chief Investment Officer and Managing Partner at the Bonson Group. And uh, the market is now closed for the week. I'm recording after the close on Friday afternoon. And so we'll have plenty of things we can kind of unpack here for you in, in the week that was. Um, it is actually a very special Dividend Cafe to me this week. And I don't mean because I think it's so good and I'm so proud of my writing or anything like that. I, I really never feel that way. I feel when I say that I'm, I'm fond of this week's Dividend Cafe, it's because it touches on some topics that are very important to me and that I think are very important, uh, ought to be very important to investors and, and, and meaningful to the clients for whom I um, care. The um, week that we just got done with was a very interesting week in the markets. We're going to talk about that and then kind of unpack some much bigger picture issues. Um, a couple housekeeping things first. We are uh, hosting a national video call on Monday right after the weekend, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, reach out to us if you did not receive the invite for that call. No RSVPs required, but the link and the registration code and all that stuff was in the invite, so reach out to us if you'd like that for our call on uh, Monday, uh, April the, the 20th. And, and uh, furthermore, I want to just sort of remind you of the daily um, market writing that we're doing at covidandmarkets.com, trying to every day provide some updated info around the health data, um, the public policy ramifications, Fed, uh, uh, Congress, and then obviously certain investor implications. It's maybe written um, for a little bit more uh, sophisticated investors. I don't think it's particularly complicated, but I do think there's a vocabulary and a cadence to it that requires a little patience if you're not necessarily familiar with all those things. But here at Dividend Cafe, I'm trying to give you macro principles and, and provide those that listen uh, to this podcast, the the kind of broad thinking, um, uh, particularly in this time period we're in now, and it, it's sort of a blur to some degree. Uh, we we the market closed up 700 points here today on Friday. Futures were pretty much up uh, 800 or so all night last night. Market actually spent most of the day um, up 300 ish, 400 ish, um, and then rallied hard at the end of the day. But unlike last week, which was a really significant move higher, uh, a couple, you know, thousand points on the week, this week actually the market was down coming into Friday. We ended up on the week up a few hundred points, um, but we had a big down day earlier in the week and we, we had some back and forth type action. I will, uh, look, I obviously you know anyone w likes the up days and that's great. And, and I'm sitting here looking at my screen, the... Uh, the VIX today was down 5%. It's at 38 right now. So the VIX is not exactly signaling that we're out of the woods in terms of fear and, and volatility and whatnot. But 38 is a lot lower than in the 80s, where it was a couple weeks ago. Um, and oh, I've said before, and I actually said this even before markets began improving, that even beyond the the ending of the big down days, what we really needed for markets to feel more normal was an ending of the big up days too. Meaning as long as the markets are up 500, 700, it means that there's probably days coming where they're down 500-ish as well. And if net-net, like has been the case over the last several weeks, you're getting more big up days than down days, the, the market could still be moving much higher. The, the Dow closed today 6,000 points, 33% higher than its low point on March 24th. I mean, that's a remarkable number. Um, but the point being that there's still a lot of vulnerability in markets that are able to move with such swings back and forth. And so to feel that you have a more stabilized environment, um, I think is still a ways away. Uh, but really, the, the news in the market right now is not based on the fact that unemployment got a lot better and uh, the economy improved a lot and so forth. I mean, we know that the nation is still essentially shut down. And even with a little bit more clarity around a path towards reopening, most of which I, I find to be quite encouraging, frankly, 
But even there, we also know that there's still um, new cases every day and, and new deaths, tragically. And so it isn't like the entire health pandemic is totally behind us. Now, the, the fears of an overloaded hospital system, if they were ever legitimate fears, um, they're, they're largely off the table now. States that were previously begging for thousands of ventilators are now themselves lending out or giving out ventilators. There's excess capacity of hospital beds in every state in the country, and and all these things are modeling in such a way to only be getting better and better. That That's all very good, primarily, of course, just for our society and for our health and well-being. Um, the question that people come to me for is related to investments in economy, not necessarily my medical expertise, for which I have none. Um, I probably learned more about epidemiology than um, in the last few weeks than I thought I would ever learn on any medical or scientific related field my whole entire adult life. Um, and maybe that's true of a lot of you, because I think the subject matter has sort of been put into our face in a way that we never really thought possible. But um, no, my, my perspectives right now are not based on, you know, we're going to peak here or we are, we're bending this curve or, or any of those types of things. I'm following the data like anyone. Um, I form certain opinions along the way, uh, like anyone, but um, I believe that what is very clear to me is that markets, being discounters of risk and and reward, believe that a lot of the left tail risk, meaning the very severe negative potential scenarios that were on the table a few weeks ago, have largely been priced away. And yet, there's still some significant uncertainty. I, I, I don't just mean uncertainty. I mean really um, broad range of potential outcomes about how uh, things are going to play out economically. And this is where I'm going to spend a lot of my time. It, it, the section I wrote in Dividend Cafe this week is called Another New Normal. Because it has occurred to me more and more over, I guess, this last week, but really it began probably the week prior um, I'm hearing an awful lot of people talk about how the world will never be the same. Uh, we're, we're experiencing a permanent change, and we're going to have to just adjust to it. And 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 all, all that's fine. I'm not saying I disagree or agree or anything. I, I guess I'm saying I've heard these sentences before. I heard them um, after 9-11, but I really heard them profoundly and with spe specificity it, uh, as an investor, um, as an economist, in the financial crisis, when people um, relayed the message in 2008 and, and into early 2009 that we now had a new normal, they were relaying a message that um, some bad things happened and it was going to color the way forward for good. And at the time, it was focused on a deleveraging American consumer. Uh, it's a thesis I have a very hard time wrapping my arms around for anyone who's ever spent any time with any American. Um, the notion of a secular trend of Americans that just simply desire to spend less money. I've never observed it. And I definitely think there's been periods when Americans have spent less money. Uh, the Great Depression was a good example. And certainly out of the recession, there was a forced uh, decrease in, in uh, discretionary spending. But um, the kind of will of the American consumer... Uh, uh, the spirit of the American consumer, from my observation, has always been to spend with both hands as long as there is any capacity to do so. And, and so the notion of uh, a completely categorical different world centered around deleveraging and greater intervention of government uh, post-financial crisis, some parts of it were true. Um, the mortgage leverage did come off significantly, thank God, post-financial crisis. And I would like to hope and pray that we'd never see those levers, levels of leverage again. Um, there was excessive indebtedness relative to home values, and it created one of the worst economic catastrophes in world history. So I never viewed it as a negative when people said it was a new normal. As far as the greater hand of government, a lot of that was definitely true if people mean by that central banking. The, the role of monetary policy um, did forever change, I think, out of the financial crisis. And I think that we're seeing that right now in, in our response to COVID, that there is a immediate appetite and acceptance 
of a very primary role of the Federal Reserve and how they're going to come in to normalize and liquefy financial markets. And a lot of that is acceptable right now because the training wheels were sort of kicked off out of the financial crisis. But as far as the idea that, um, you know, there'd be higher regulation and uh, banks are going to be forced to be much smaller and so forth, a lot of that kind of, I mean, it's true in, in some areas, but more or less, the corporate economy post-crisis levered up again, levered up, I think, very wisely. I think it, it was very well-utilized leverage that, re, that resulted in much higher return on equity, much higher return on invested capital, and obviously much higher corporate profitability as corporate profits essentially quadrupled, and not coincidentally, the stock market quadrupled out of that period. So the tangent I'm on right now is on purpose, because all of this language about a new normal, right now we're hearing things, and I'm not disagreeing. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how people are going to act at restaurants, at sports games, at movie theaters, um, and I can't tell you when they're going to act a certain way and when they're going to not act a certain way. I can only tell you this from the vantage point of free enterprise. The idea that there is something happening that will permanently impede the ability of free enterprise to work is probably the most ridiculous thing anybody can c conclude from what we're dealing with right now with coronavirus. It stems from a massive misunderstanding of the power of free enterprise and also the self-interest the, the self -interest of a profit motive, uh, the innovation that comes from desperation and when all of a sudden your restaurant is told you can't be configured this way, and how proprietors are able to reconfigure to still somehow, some way, figure it out. Uh, I have absolutely no interest in underestimating the power of the American entrepreneur. Um, will there be headwinds, of course? Will there be obstacles, of course? And will there be casualties along the way, not just in the medical and truly sad sense of the word, but in the more crass economic sense? Will there be businesses that don't make it? Will there be households that struggle? Uh, obviously. Uh, but what I mean on a broader standpoint in terms of the functioning of the American economy and the resurgence of corporate profitability is that I don't accept the context of a new normal, meaning um, the inability for free enterprise to work. Uh, I, I joked out of 2009, 10, 11, 12, when this nomenclature was so popular, and yet uh, investment markets were performing so well, the economy began to grow. Um, and I said, well, if this is the new normal, give me more of this. And I strongly suspect that there'll be more of that into the future. Now, it's not going to stop the, the perma pessimist. You know, there's going to be data to extract that's going to be bad. And then when that data isn't bad anymore, there'll be other data that is bad. And I think there's a sort of sociology to this I've talked about recently on a video. But, but um, my, my point right now is not to make a bullish argument about what's going to happen in the next month, three months, six months, because I believe bulls and bears have one thing in common right now, short term. They just do not know. I confess to being a perma-bull long term. And I confess to being a perma agnostic short term. Um, you know, look, it was only three months ago that we had a good tick up in GDP growth, the record low unemployment, record level of, of wage growth had come off a, a 25 percent year in equity markets, uh, had come out of fears of tightening credit and, and of a trade war a year, year and a half earlier. A lot of these things were, were rolling, and I don't think that people were necessarily thinking at that time, all this is going great, but what if all of a sudden there's a global health p a pandemic? You know, things can come up out of nowhere. I understand that. That's part of, of the very, it's one of the very difficult parts about life as an investor for all of you, but also particularly life as an investment manager for me. I mean, I accept the lot in life that God has given me. But I do want to say that those who are choosing to apply the present pain and distress and uncertainty around the economy being shut down into a long-term macro trend that people will not live their lives again or there will not be economic prosperity again, um, I, I strongly disagree with. 
I, I, and I say that without clarity as to what those innovations will be and alterations in society. Without knowing what they will be, I only know that they will be. Um, and, and so now into the shorter term context that a lot of people like to talk about, uh, would I consider myself bullish or bearish? And I really don't think it's quite that simple. I'd be very cautious about strong convictions either way. Let me put it that way. For those who want to point out the known knowns of, of unemployment, of small business vulnerability, of political dysfunction, of um, the, the idea that even when the economy reopens, there will still be people that are not comfortable going out again and so forth. Um, perhaps you have a longer tail of diminished travel, vacationing, uh, hotel visits, restaurant dining, things of that nature. Okay, I, all the, those data points could go um, into a very negative direction, even more negative perhaps than anticipated. Uh, I don't know that they will, but I certainly think you have to kind of be prepared for that. But with a um, acceptance of some of the bearish data points, you do have to interpret those up against some of the kind of compelling bullish data points as well, such as the fact that we've never seen this level of stimulus injected in the economy. A lot of that stimulus, by the way, I would argue is long term concerning for other reasons. But in the short term, um, can we really say that the, let's say, unprecedented pain and anguish of, of restaurants being closed down in a different way than they ever have been, that we know that's going to have a macroeconomic impact? And yet we don't know that the, the possibility exists of trillions of dollars of monetary stimulus offsetting some of that or trillions of dollars of fiscal stimulus offsetting some of it. Again, that's not in defense of the stimulus per se. And that's certainly not said without attention to the fact that both of those stimulus packages and plans carry with them a cost as well longer term. And, I, and it's something I intend to be writing about and dealing with as an investor for years to come. However, up against the don't fight the Fed mantra, the unprecedented levels of fiscal stimulus, um, there's also this sense of, and I think a lot of this is driving markets now, you have bond yields at below 1%. You have international equities that at best case have equal value propositions and most often have even more risk characteristics associated with them. And so you do have a sense in which asset allocators all over the globe, from international equity bond options to domestic bond options into domestic U.S. stocks, might very well have to conclude for quite some time U.S. public equities are the best game in town, even if there are things about them that, they, that, that have those concerns and risks. Now, I certainly would agree um, that the, the, the sell-off we have now could very well reverse to some degree. There will be ongoing market volatility. The market still seems very subjected to headline risk day by day, week by week. Um, there's a lot of questions about leadership. You know, I, I could go on and on. I could make up plenty of reasons to be short-term bearish, and I wouldn't be making them up. They're, they're real catalyst to day by day market volatility. But to the extent that I'm a fiduciary and my team of partners and advisors are all fiduciaries and we counsel clients with goals on capital needs, we do not have the option of making decisions that will impact them for five years, 10 years, 20 years around what may or may not happen for five days, five weeks, five months. We have to maintain a timeline in our decision making that matches the timeline for a client's actual goals. So in that sense, the new normal is the old normal. And that is that new factors and catalysts and factoids and circumstances enter the fray all the time. And yet in the context of American free enterprise and of um, the risk reward realities embedded in capital markets, I believe that investors uh, will derive their return and results in the years ahead around good decision making um, and not trying to uh, short term guess market direction. Uh, I believe that with every ounce of breath in my body and 
I would believe that even if we were still sitting here at 19,000 on the Dow, um, uh, apart from the kind of relief rally that we've enjoyed here over the last few weeks. That relief rally, by the way, <clears throat> there's a couple charts in DividendCafe.com that are, are violent, and I hope you will find them to be profound. Because I want people to understand what was taking place the week of March 16th and the beginning of the week of March 23rd. Um, there was $400 billion of forced selling out of just risk parity hedge funds alone. Um, several hundred billion more out of uh, various market neutral and computer model strategies. And uh, we, 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 on top of that, had the more kind of organic and, and, and easy to understand levels of margin selling and for selling where people just simply needed to access cash. So I've talked a lot about how that impacted municipal bonds, even treasury bonds, high grade corporate bonds, how all those other asset classes got so dislocated. And some of them still sit here with minor dislocations embedded in their pricing. And people thought it was just a stock market crash. But what took place was really a, uh, um, a revolt in capital markets as uh, so much forced selling hit the tape at once. And, and so understanding those kind of extra couple thousand points down for what they were is very important. Now, we sit here in the halfway point, more or less. Uh, markets were here and they came to here and now they're back halfway in between those two numbers. And I just want to be very, very candid. Apart from the disclaimer I've already given about not knowing if we go backwards from here, I don't expect that we're going forward quickly and suddenly. I most certainly believe we're going forward eventually. I most certainly believe that the ability of many, many fine American companies to grow their cash flows and grow their dividends that they pay from the cash flows uh, will lead to uh, higher um, prices uh, through time. But in terms of seeing the broader markets reset to higher levels, obviously um, there's a sense in which we need to be on the other side of the economic damage. But there's also a sense in which that economic story isn't going to play out in a straight line. There's going to be companies that are going to shock people by benefiting from the whole sordid state of affairs. There's going to be companies that um, see their stock prices go higher even though they're suffering because they're not suffering as much as maybe the market expected. There's going to be companies that are doing well but not as well as maybe the, the market thought they would, and so they might actually see stock prices decline. And, and, and there will be companies that... Um, are going to surprise, you know, on the downside, doing worse than even expected. So you're going to have all these different quadrants. There's multiple quadrants of what could end up happening in the market. In a macro sense, I expect volatility. I expect there to be, and I don't just mean the obvious of markets going up and down. I mean volatility in the headlines, volatility in the politics, volatility in the public policy response, and, and volatility in sentiment uh, around it all. Um, I know that the economy is not going to open up all at once. That will add to some of the volatility. Now, it needs to be that way from a health standpoint, um, because if the economy were to open all at once, it would not be when the first state is ready to go. It would be when the last state is ready to go. And, and I don't want that. I, I want to see the economy open up incrementally so that some number of people can begin productive activities sooner than later. And yet, when you are subject to kind of a tearing in of uh, restating economic activity, I believe it is going to subject us to various ups and downs and spurts and sputters along the way. Um, I would be optimistic about how this will play out in the end. Uh, I would not expect a V-shaped recovery in the entire economy, but I most certainly would expect some form of a U-shaped recovery. And that, that will end up allowing gradual over time uh, uh, demand resurfacing where it is eroded. And then, um, of course, the production necessary to meet that demand and then to create its own demand. And this is where my supply side um, economic biases come in. Ultimately, human beings are meant to produce. And as we produce more goods and services, out of uh, our own innovations, creative talents, and profit motives, um, then you create demand. 
And uh, that's the beauty of free market economics. And so how that gets priced into capital markets right away, it's going to take some time to play out. People that need income from their investments on the way should be invested in income generating investments that will not see volatility in that cash flow or downside volatility in that cash flow um, while they wait things out. Uh, people are trying to accumulate towards the future, should allow that process to play out and reinvest along the way, capturing a compounding of their returns over time. It's pretty simple when it's put that way, but I know it isn't so simple in real life, as the last couple months have proven. The amount of topics that I cover here in DividendCafe.com that I did not just cover here in today's podcast are plentiful. So please do go to DividendCafe.com over the weekend and and read through some of the other topics that we covered. Um, I really enjoy uh, my conversations with you, the clients who have reached out, uh, the, the um, people who have questions, continue reaching out to us. Uh, there's nothing I want more than to provide the information and perspective necessary right now for good, sound decision-making. I uh, remain very grateful. I speak on behalf of everyone at the Bonson Group. Uh, we remain very grateful for those of you who are clients who have entrusted your financial care to our well-being. We take it seriously. We intend to continue doing so. Thank you for listening to and viewing this week's Dividend Cafe.